Coming up, I check out the ZX VGA Joy. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. I continue with the business feature and end with a typing. Let's get on then. There are several methods to improve the video signal coming out of your spectrum. You can do a composite mod, which involves snipping a wire and soldering another one, well, in its easiest form, and this will mean you can connect the old RF socket to a composite input of a TV or monitor. This provides a decent enough signal and much better than RF. Other methods include third-party interfaces such as the Connex Liberator. This and other interfaces do the work for you in converting the signal. If you want the ultimate, then the obvious choice is the ZX HDMI. That will convert the spectrum signal into a crisp clear HDMI signal. If, however, you have an old PC monitor hanging about, there is another option. This, the ZX VGA. This interface allows you to plug your spectrum into almost any monitor or TV that has a VGA input, and this includes most modern televisions. It outputs in various different resolutions and frequencies, such as 640x480 and 800x600, with frequencies varying from 50 to 75 Hz. On top of that, there's various zoom options to play with, and the interface also has a Kempston joystick socket and a reset button. One advantage of using VGA is that the signal is perfectly synchronised with the ULA, meaning games that use border effects or multicolours should work perfectly. We will test this later. The interface itself is quite small, and about the same size as a joystick interface, and it looks really professionally well made. Once plugged into the spectrum, and it works with all models, you connect a VGA lead to the back of it, and plug the other end into your monitor or TV. Once your spectrum boots up, you'll see the normal Sinclair copyright message. Pressing the reset button on the interface will take you to a menu where you can select the resolution and frequency of the output. Let's start with 640x480 at 50Hz then, using a screen from Attic Attack. Yes, it looks superb. Really crisp and clear. Even zoomed in it looks good. Switching to a higher refresh rate, and there are no issues at all, apart from the stretched screen, which makes the games look a bit wide. Let's move up to 800 by 600 then at 60 Hz. And if you select the correct aspect ratio, you'll get a full border, and the spectrum screen looks spot on now. It looks much better. If you do need to reset your spectrum, all you have to do is press and hold down the reset button. Let's try out a fast moving game then. How about Death Chase? Yes, it looks really nice. No blurring that I can see. Now for that timing test. Let's try Aquaplane and see if the border split effect works. Yes, it does. And it looks superb through this interface. How about something with dithered graphics then? Let's try Hundra. Despite me setting the wrong keys and making a complete fool of myself, the game looks pretty good. And now another test, multicoloured graphics. For this to work, the timings have to be exact, something HDMI struggles with. Sunbucket. Looks good so far. And yes, no problems at all, and it does look excellent. Now remember, I'm filming this on a camera, so in real life it looks even better. And what about small text, something like Tassword? The interface has no problems at all with this, and the text is very, very readable. In conclusion then, this is a brilliant interface. Easy to use, quite affordable, and the results are really excellent. The picture quality is easy on the eyes, and multicolour games work fine. It doesn't have a pass-through port though, so it will have to be the last device in the chain if you want to use something like an SD card interface. But as you can see from my tests, it works fine with the DivMMC Joy. It's a great interface then, and highly recommended. This is Cycles from Accolade, released in 1989, and I'm going to review the Plus 3 disc version. 
The box includes screenshots from non-Spectrum games, and the instructions really hype up the game. The only motorcycle game with a first-person perspective, it says. Look over the handlebars and see the road disappearing under your wheels. It all sounds fantastic. Let's load it up then. You can choose to ride three different bikes, a 125cc, a 250cc or a 500cc. Each are obviously different and have different handling capabilities. You can pick from a variety of tracks and they are shown in map form as well, giving you some information. So you can pick an easy one to start with. Let's go for USA. You can opt to practice or go straight in for a single race or try the full championship. Now this game refuses to load on various emulators including Spectaculator and Spin. Spin did a better job with the digitized speech at the start but then just stopped. SpecMU though worked fine. There are three difficulty levels and this just comes down to the bike you choose. The 125 is for the beginner so I went for that. This gives you automatic gears, no damage and less difficult riders to beat. On to the practice then. That was a nice engine sound, but the bike is so difficult to keep in a straight line. You sway about almost uncontrollably. This is not me being a bad game player. Hitting the left key will send the bike left, but then it just keeps on going. So you have to stab the right key to correct it, and then the bike sways back and keeps on going right. It's very difficult to actually go in a straight line. And this makes the game very frustrating. You spend all of the game fighting with the controls, which means you can't really enjoy it. The scenery is fine and moves smoothly enough, and the feeling of speed is okay. I couldn't see a way to look behind you like the instructions suggest, but then again, with the awful steering mechanic, it would be probably best for me to keep concentrating on keeping the bike straight. I just can't get this steering thing, it's almost like the bike is on ice, and one tiny movement and you end off going into the grass. Luckily, with the 125 bikes, there's no damage, but it does slow you down. Let's move up to the 250 then and do a proper race. This isn't going well. First you have to qualify, and this sets your starting position on the grid. I tried to slow down for the corners, but it didn't really help. Eventually the three laps were over, and I found myself last on the grid. Nice. Once into the race and, oh, I blew up my engine. Let's try again then. Ah, oh, I thought I'd selected automatic transmission, but ah, never mind. Okay, let's go with manual gears then, and we're off. The map at the bottom shows a lot of other riders, but I haven't seen any yet. I'm sure I'll catch up with them. Ah, there they are. This bike, the 250, handles slightly better, I think. It doesn't make it any less annoying, though. Well, according to this, I'm in third place, which is not bad, but oh dear, right. The game, I think, moves too far into a simulation, but then it tries to be an action game, and the balance is just not quite right. Either go for a full simulation with engine tweaks and suspension changes, or go for a full arcade racer like Super Hang On. Don't try and hover around in the middle. This game can't make its mind up what it needs, and the results soon become frustrating. This is Hellfire Attack, released by Martek in 1989, and again I'm reviewing the disc version. Your mission is to fly a Super Cobra attack helicopter, but the instructions don't really say what the ultimate goal is, it just says you fly deep into enemy territory. You have various weapons, a rotary cannon which fires automatically, 40 Hellfire missiles which you fire once a target is acquired, and a turbo boost, and this will help you avoid enemy fire, but for unknown reasons can also turn you upside down. Looking at the back of the box, which shows screenshots from other versions, 
It looks like some sort of afterburner clone. Let's get into the game then. Nice digitised music, and we're on to the game. Well, I'm not really sure what's going on here. The screen is very busy. The reduced size coupled with the large sprites makes it feel very claustrophobic. It appears that regardless what I do, I get shot down. The fire key is space. The turbo key is space. So you often find yourself being flipped upside down for no reason. You were just trying to shoot something. And that disrupts any plans you had of actually trying to line up a shot. I don't know I ever did shoot anything. I mean, the score went up, but there was nothing on screen amongst the mess of pixels that I could see that indicated there was an explosion. The game is pretty poor, to be honest. I tried, I really did, and even got to the second level. But that was short-lived, again due to the poor visuals and constant flipping upside down. Now and again, you get a large enemy plane to shoot, but you usually get shot before you even have a chance. I tried two approaches. First, constantly moving to avoid anything, and only shooting when I had acquired a target. But that ended badly. I then tried firing continuously, in the hope I would hit something. But that ended equally badly. The game was a letdown. I was expecting more from a later game and one on disc. The screen was far too cluttered and the aiming and firing haphazard. One to stay away from then. This is Dig Dug Dug, written by Gabriele More in 2022. This is a fantastic little game based around Dig Dug. You have to clear the mines of hazardous waste, and to do this, you have to make tunnels. You need to be careful though, if you accidentally hit one of the crates, it will explode and possibly kill you. Crates automatically drop down, but can be picked up and moved left or right. And you have to get at least one of them out of the mine. Using this mechanic, you have to drop them and push them to the bottom right, where the green pipe will take them away. Also in the mines are creatures that are not too bright, but will kill you if they hit you. You can dispose of these like Dig Dug by inflating them until they explode. The game has some nice music and effects, and once you get the idea of the controls and how it all works, it's a great little game you can keep coming back to. Later levels have fire-breathing enemies, skulls and other things that explode and kill you on contact. This will certainly give you a challenge. Definitely track this one down. Hi Paul. Hello. And, and today we're going to talk about Pajama Armor. Okay. 
from or microgen. I'm going to yeah. play it. Yep. Yeah, from microgen. Or rather, like we did with Attic Attack, after that seemed to be a hit with everyone, we've decided that I'm going to play it and try and complete Pajama Armor while you try to put me off by asking me random questions I, again. I wasn't trying to put you off. I was trying to get some information about the game. There's only three keys, so a lot easier than Attic Attack. Much, much easier than Attic Attack. The first thing I'm going to do is get the pound coin. So, so I, I, I noticed then when you went through the door, it used the same screen clearing as Automania as well. Very similar you know in what? some respects to that because it, you know the screens have got big chunky graphics and there's yeah various things going on. So oh, hang on, would have just gone through a barrel? Yeah, you can go through barrels. We need the bucket next because we need to fill the bucket up. You, you, how do you go? Through, why, what? <laughs> how, is that in the manual? You can go through barrels, or did you just find it? I have literally no idea because it must be nearly thirty years since I've read the manual. Right. Okay. Oh, I remember that hand never... under the stairs. Uh, yeah, if you're not careful, you get groped from under the uh, floor. <laughs> in several rooms, it, it's, uh, it can be quite disturbing. We don't want the help on yet, so what we do what, is... What, what we does the help on? Are you going to explain that when we get to it? I'll explain it when we get to it. Okay. So, did you work out what the objects were? Did you look in a, a magazine for tips? Or did you just try everything everywhere? Because the thing that gets me about... You, you know, you've adventures... already distracted me. <laughs> Sorry. The thing that... no, it's, all, it's all right. Um, I've got, I've got to say, I just realised, I thought, hold on, that's wrong. I was supposed to drop the bucket straight away. Let's see if I can get the balance there. Yay. Um, yeah, you've already managed to distract me because in the room after this one, uh, the penny lets you go through the door to the loo. Uh, I didn't spend a penny. All oh, right. And you can get the hammer. And you need the hammer to get the fire extinguisher. And I th I'm hoping my objects are on the wrong way around now. No, they're the right way around. Right. So the thing that, I wouldn't say annoys me, but is a bit weird for me in these games is you either spend hours and hours and hours picking things up and going to different rooms and putting things down in different rooms, or you look at magazines to get tips. I mean, is that is that what you did? How did you approach it? So I played it a little bit, and we worked a few things out. Like later, I will use the library ticket to get the book. We worked that out, but then couldn't work out. We knew, we knew the book should go in here, but those books up there will kill you unless you have a certain item. Um, also, we worked out that the... Um, it's funnily enough, we worked out that the driving license gets you the ignition keys, but no further. And if you slide down that baluster, baluster uh, the ignition keys will then get you the um, helmet, which is the other thing you need to stop, is the thing that stops those books from killing you. So in this one, for example, the fire extinguisher stops that fire. And we worked out that the hammer got you the fire extinguisher. We did get that far. But never that, that let you drop down here. And the BP can. So when you went into that place with the books, the, uh, there was the name Pete written on the book. Does that is that one of the authors or one of the pe people that involved in the game? Or was it just a random name? I'm not sure it must be somebody connected to Microgen. I have absolutely no <laughs> idea. Oh, ah, there's something to, to look up. And the game uses, or doesn't use, um, masks, so it's there's colour clash everywhere. Yeah, there is. Um, it, it's kind of, this game's attitude to colour clash was, let's just ignore it. Oh, let's yep. just let it happen. Now you'll find, you go into the lift a lot in this game, and I'll go up to floor one, oh, which is okay. kind of in is the that, That's the lift, is it? I thought it was some sort of uh, yeah. code to a safe or something. Okay, so it's, yeah, right, got you. Yeah, so that's the lift, and you go up to floor one a lot in this in this game. Um, this is already the second time I've been up, and I'll probably come up at least once or twice more. Um, oh, one of the annoying things is the lift seems to randomly stop working every now and then. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. And then, oh, there's the Space Invaders. Yeah, the Space Invaders again. Are you, yeah. not, are you not going to play? Can you play it, or is it, are they just there? Ah, um, you can play a Space Invader game. You don't need to to complete the game, though. Ah, right. Ah, the lift's turned off, which is a bit annoying. And does every object have oh, no. a purpose, or are there some red herrings? No, there are. There are. I'm pretty sure there are some red herrings. Um, that R key that's in that room, I'm pretty sure is a, a red herring that you start with. But a lot of them do. So that that door there with video games written on it, mm. uh, you can go in there, and if you get that joystick, you can uh, then shoot the aliens. Oh, okay. You don't need to do that to complete the game. Apparently, if you complete enough. Um, 
screens of that of the aliens in in the video game room you get a free life but i've never managed to come yeah end up with more lives than i needed so this is sliding down the balance though the ignition keys will get the helmet yeah a lot of the th a lot of the items do do things and assuming i do finish which i'm doing pretty well here so I probably will um you'll see that it'll give you a percentage completed so when you finish it tells you how many steps you took oh, and right. what what percentage complete of the adventure is complete and it won't be 100 percent because there's things like shooting the aliens that we won't have done um what on earth am i doing here i played this very briefly when i got it because it wasn't what i expected i expected it to be something along the lines of auto mania yeah and then when i got it and noticed i had to pick things up and I, I just to be honest i just couldn't be bothered to work out what everything did so i'm interested to see it, it being played i've not seen a walkthrough i've not seen an azx and i've not seen any hints or tips so yeah. i'm just interested to see um well things like you can use the barrels to go through and you can slide down the banister i knew there were space invaders there um, so yeah. it's just interesting for me to watch which is i'm not asking questions to to distract you i'm just asking questions out of interest really Oh, right, so mm -hmm. turning the help on puts that tea chest there. So you don't need to do it until quite late in the game. And if you come into this room, uh, after turning it on, it goes back off again and it'll disappear. So it's only there for like kind of... Uh, oh no, we need to go back the other way. Um, right, so when you get the box key, you can get the magnet. And you need the magnet to release the magnetic lock, which is on the moon for some reason. Of course it is. Um, and we're nearly there, really. Yeah. Oh, don't want to pick that up. But yeah, if you want, after this, after I've finished it, we can uh, we can shoot shoot space invaders in that. <laughs> if you want. Ah, the magnetic lock. Right, ah, we could even yeah. getting up these is a pain. So there we go. We have got the clock key. All you need to get do is get back to the room where Wally's sleeping and use it on the clock, and you you're done. Gropey hands. <laughs> the first time I played this, and that came up and killed it, and they take a lot of energy. I, w I was like, oh no! Um, actually, something something a bit ooh, different. If I can get past. Nah, I can't get past there without putting that on. The. Um, that little box in that room is called the conveyor belt control, and that stops the that room pushing you to the right. So you can just walk on it normally if you're holding that. Ah, okay. And there we go. We finished. Marvellous. Is is there a spectacular end? Oh, it's the fireworks. It's, it looks a bit like, it's pen fireworks. Looks like yeah. Penetrator. But the, it has got standard at the bottom for those old enough to know what standard means. The old standard fireworks. Yeah. I think you can still get standard fireworks, can't you? I have no idea. I've set up a business, I've bought some hardware, I've implemented stock control and a spreadsheet, placed adverts, bought stock and packaging, and the business is now ready to get up and running. There is still one more thing I need to do though, the dreaded finance and accounting. <laughs> Every business has to maintain and submit accounts, if only to make sure they're running at a profit and are going along with government rules. I looked at several finance and accounting packages and sadly this area is a bit of a wasteland. Plus 80 finance manager looked good but only works on tapes and because it's in machine code there's no way to change it. Sinclair's offering was okay but again without digging around in the code it was limited to tapes. In the end and after some testing I thought I would try simple business accounts. A bit of a wild card, but it seemed to have everything I needed, plus it was written in basic, so easy to change. Upon loading it and seeing the awful colour scheme, the first thing to do was to try and save it to disk. The program is in basic, and looking at line 9999 gave us a good idea of how to do this. A quick save, and it was that simple. Ooh, it looks a bit bright, but it covers most things I need, and if it really annoys me, I can always drop back into basic and change things. The parameters option 
which I assumed would be where you change things to do with passwords and where data was saved, I couldn't get to. It was password protected. I couldn't see anything in the basic code that gave any clues, so I made a wild guess. And yes, I was successful. Now I can change the company name and the medium to load and save to, as well as the printer. Now back to the main menu and... Ah, out of memory. Damn it. I wonder if this is linked to the Plus D interface, because it worked fine in emulation with microdrives. Now this leaves me in all kinds of trouble. Digging about in the code, I tried to remove the close commands from line 100, and this allowed the program to run, but when saving, another error appeared, and this is linked to the erase command. Luckily, the plus D will handle file overwrites, so I can remove this. However, the open and close commands were also not accepted. The program was trying to open streams and save the data, which the plus D was just not happy about. After about 30 minutes of trying, I gave up. I think if I'd have persevered, I could have got it working, but it just wasn't worth the effort. And in the end, I had to settle for the old favourite, Sinclair's Small Business Accounts. Now this does not support microdrives out of the box, but it is written in BASIC, and a quick glance through the code showed me I could get it working and saving to disk without any problems. So with a quick change, that was easy to get working. Now to make this work with microdrive commands, I had to make a few simple changes. But first, I needed to create a base data set. According to the manual, I have to load side one of the tape, which I did, and then initialize it. This allows me to set up the current state of the business. So, a personal amount of £1,000 plus a loan from the bank of £4,000 should do it. I now have to make this balance to continue, so I just shove £5,000 on the bank. Now I can save out this starting set, but first I need to change some lines. Line 7501 has the save routine, and that's a quick fix, and I can take out the verify here. Now do it all again. Once saved, I can then load side B to get the full program. But before I loading the saved data, I just need to make a few edits to the code. Even the manual tells you to break into the program and amend various things, including the password needed to get into the system. First, that beep is too long, so line 498 seems to be the culprit. Change that back to zero. Next, the load and save commands. These are at lines 7500 and 6500. I change the syntax and remove the verify. I also change the prompt from tape to disk, just to make it look better. Next was to change the main menu to remove the word tape from the save option. And now I can go back and save the full program again. Before I do that, I want to change the colour scheme to make it look more business-like. Now we're ready to actually use it. Once loaded, I have to load in the data I'd previously saved. And as I've not sold anything yet, I can't enter income and sales or invoices. Once I start to sell games, I can add invoices here, although the stock control program does that as well. I suppose I can add just one large invoice for the total amount of games per month sold. That'd be far easier. Now then, let's do a print test. Ah, that didn't work. I think this is because the plus D just doesn't like the copy command, which is what this program uses. So I can change that in the code to the plus D equivalent, which is save screens one. Now let's try again. And yes, that works. Although my new color scheme has made it print out in inverse. Oh dear, we'll have to swap that back then. Digging deep into the code, swapping things around, and yes, that's much better. There are a lot of print options throughout the program that need changing, probably about 15, and it's a long process. Finally, we can save it to disk again, and let's start using it then, properly. Let's go in and add some purchases, because as you know, I bought a few things. Start with £150, and the program kindly tells you the VAT. This is for the adverts in Crash, so I type in Crash, and then from the options, I select Adverts. Next, I bought some envelopes, so £34 plus VAT, and I bought them from MaxPap. 
Next, I bought some software that I've been using up to date. So I guess that's about £200. And this is just general goods. And of course, my last purchase was my stock, running in at £771.90 plus VAT from Hobbit Distribution. And again, this is goods. Right, that's done. We're all ready to start trading. I will update this every month, or I would do if it were real, with any new purchases and sales. It's a tedious task, but now everything is set up, it should be quite easy. And at this stage, I can also get a printout. Let's try it again with the proper colours. I can also run various reports whenever I need to. For example, I can see the balance sheet, profit and loss, and many other things. And that's it. We're ready to move on. This is Laserlord, released by Century City in 1985. The year is 2113, and you are the supreme laser warrior of Earth. And you're the only one capable of operating the orbiting weapon, Guardian, and must now defend the Earth against the invading Martian fleet. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So it's just like a typical typing game, really. The alien shows where they're going to appear, which is a novel idea, and you then have to move and shoot them. The character movement, unresponsive controls and basic beeps, yeah, yes, it's a basic game. Every now and again, a meteor will appear, and it's almost impossible to hit them. When they land, they make a hole in the ground, which stops you from moving. And this is more or less the end of the game, because if the aliens appear where you can't get them, they land and take a life. The aliens do move left and right a bit, rather than going straight down, which is a typical typing thing, which makes them easier to hit, and your ship also moves faster than they do. It's a decent enough game, but I wouldn't really recommend it, it's just a glorified typing. Here is Chasm, that appeared in Popular Computing Weekly in July 1984. It was even the star game, which usually meant the game was a bit better than some of the other listings to appear in the magazine. It was written by R. Grimwood, and as you can see, it's a full page of basic. A lot of the listing is either instructions or poke statements, setting up the user-definable graphics. After typing it out, I hit a few minor problems. Firstly, the tunnel remained the same when it was supposed to change direction, this was quickly fixed though, and then the number of lives was set to check for zero instead of less than one, which meant at one point I had minus seven lives left. And lastly, there was a random number printed on screen when the fire button was pressed. Now that's fixed, let's give it a go. It's a standard upward scrolling game with a tunnel to navigate through, and there are many such games for the spectrum. However, there's slight differences here. You can move left, right, up and down, and you also have a fire option, which you can use to destroy the aliens. Once you've progressed far enough and destroyed enough aliens, you go on to the next level, and here the tunnel narrows even more. The game does have an end, but it's very tricky to reach, so there's definitely a challenge here, and I've yet to manage it. This is probably the first time the game has been seen since 1983, and it's available free to download from my website. 